So, so far we have discussed uh, about titanium sapphire laser and how it gets mode locked by itself by something called car lens mode locking. Now, we are not so lucky in all lasers. Not all lasers would behave like a tie sapphire laser and get self mode locked. Especially when you want to produce picosecond pulses and nanosecond pulses, you have to put in some effort and get the pulses uh, prepared. And one method by which as we have discussed you can get short pulses is mode locking. There are two ways in which one can achieve mode locking. One is active mode locking, one is passive mode locking. Active mode locking means we put in some device and by applying a voltage or doing something we try and mode lock the pulses. In passive mode locking we put in an element to which we do not do anything, but by virtue of some property of this element itself mode locking takes place. So, in this module we are going to perform a brief discussion of both these forms of mode locking. So, active mode locking is based on what is called device shares effect and device shares effect was something that was known decades before the first laser was made. So, you can see this paper 1932 PNAS is where this was published. Now, device shares effect essentially means this you take a glass of water and uh, put it on a transducer and then apply some sound wave. What you see in the diagram is sound waves have been applied from the top and light goes through in a perpendicular direction. So, what you see in device shears effect is you see something like a diffraction. You do not see one spot going through when the sound wave is applied rather you see several along the vertical axis in this kind of a setup. Not only that the beams that are displaced from the mean position above or below are frequency modulated and the amount by which the frequency is modulated is an integral multiple of omega where omega is uh, the frequency of angular frequency of the sound wave. So, you can think like this you see in this diagram we have alternate uh, layers of light and dark you, you have some layers that are uh, white and some are not white. What does this mean? Why have we drawn it like this? No, not constructive interference yet even before that. All we have done is we have put in some sound wave right. Now remember sound wave is a little different from your electromagnetic wave. What kind of kind is, so there are two kinds of waves right transverse wave and longitudinal wave. What kind of wave is sound? It is longitudinal wave which means it propagates by alternate compression and rarefaction of the medium through which it propagates. So, in this diagram the dark region stands for uh, an amount of medium which has been compacted and the light one is where the medium is rarefied. Okay. So, it is very easy to understand in case of a gas of course, but then this uh, same mechanism happens in liquids and solids and that is how sound propagates. All right. So, this is essentially depiction of the sound wave that has been applied. Now, see if you have something like this a cylinder in which you have alternate uh, regions of uh, high and low density. Does it remind you of something that we have discussed earlier something that you know about? Well, uh, it is like a grating right or you can think it is like a uh, series of slits wherever the medium is verified you can think it is a slit where if it is compacted you can think that uh, it is a stop. So, what happens when light goes through uh, even two slits you get diffraction do not you and what is the meaning of diffraction? Yeah, so that is what happens here. So, essentially it is diffraction, okay. but then since you are applying sound wave which has a particular frequency it is not just diffraction frequency modulation also takes place. Okay. Of course, device here's effect is a lot of mathematics which are not going to go into that is too much of optics too much of physics, but we need to know the end result at least. Now, this is actually a uh, an undergraduate experiment in physics nowadays. One can buy apparatus like this. So, what you see in the apparatus in the top right panel in this slide 
it's like an aquarium in which you can fill water. On top of the aquarium, you have a transducer and at 90 degrees, a uh, laser goes in. In the setup that we have shown here, uh, you can use a red laser or a green laser. And in the bottom panel, you can see the spots that you can get if you hold a piece of paper or a photographic film on the other side. And you can see as you change the uh, intensity of the uh, sound, you get more or less number of spots. And what you can perhaps not see here is that the spots are all of different color. Can you see the different color of the spots? You can? I cannot. And I will be surprised if you see. I suspect that is that white and red is intensity because see what is the frequency of say red light? Okay, say it in hertz, forget about angular frequency. How much hertz? 10 to the power 4 centimeter inverse. Right? Is that right? 10,000, 20,000, 10 to the power 4 centimeter inverse multiplied by speed of light in centimeter, 10 to the power 8 or 10 to the power 10. So, 10 to the power 14. And what is the frequency of sound wave typically? Megahertz. Right? So, 10 to the power 14, 10 to the power 6. We are doing 10 to the power 14 plus minus 10 to the power 6. May not be so easy to see. At least I cannot see. You might be able to see. I cannot, but there are instruments that can. Okay. So, this is uh, very roughly what device here's effect is and this is the beginning of uh, our attempt to do active mode locking. Now, think why do we see this frequency modulation? Why do we have not only refraction, but also phase modulation? First of all, uh, light is going in from air into whatever that medium is. It can be quartz, it can be uh, a piece of glass, it can be something, some transparent medium. So, that is definitely a denser medium, quartz or glass or water or whatever it is, right. So, what will happen in a denser medium? Frequency will change, is that right? Why will frequency change? Because what is lambda nu? Lambda multiplied by nu that is equal to what? Actually, it is c by n, is not it? We write c because we always take n to be 1, but it is not the complete uh, statement. c by n, right? So, since n is changing, your frequency and all also have to change. Everything changes. So, now suppose I change this n periodically. What am I doing in this uh, uh, transducer? I am applying a sound wave, right? I'm it is not just a uh, block of glass, it is not just a uh, block of quartz, it is a block of glass or quartz in which I am applying a sound wave. Okay? So, as an application of sound wave, the frequency is also going to uh, your uh, sorry, the refractive index is also going to change periodically because you are applying a sound wave that is periodic. Right? So, that is what leads to phase modulation. The output in time, since we have periodic variation of n 1 by applying a frequency, some kind of frequency, the output gets phase modulated. Okay. Now, when you want to do mode locking, you have to work in what is called Raman Nath regime. Raman is the well known CV Raman, Nath was one of his students. Uh, Ramannath uh, regime means L should be much lesser than capital lambda square divided by 2 pi lambda, where capital lambda is the wavelength of sound, small lambda is the wavelength of light and L is the thickness of the mode locking medium that you want to use. Now, once again lot of mathematics we will not go into, we are not going to go into it, right. Whoever is interested. Uh, there are a lot of discussions about Ramannath's Ramannath regime uh, in say Max Bond's optics book for example. Uh, if you are interested you can read it, but it is a non trivial exercise if you want to read uh, that book. You need to understand all that math. Okay. So, in Ramannath regime this mode locking phenomenon is observed. Later on in the next module perhaps we are going to come across some other regime 
which is absolutely opposite. Well, L is much, much larger than capital lambda square by 2 pi small lambda. That is called Bragg regime. And what we will discuss is in Bragg regime, uh, you do not get this kind of an effect. You get something else. It is close, but not the same. Okay? That is what is used in what is called cavity dumping. But right now, we are discussing mode locking. And remember, mode locking can only take place in Ramanath regime. Now, what is the only thing that I have control on? Now, I have not only thing, uh, only thing perhaps I did not say it correctly. So, I know that when I want to make a mode locker, I have to be in Ramanath regime. So, what are the parameters in my control? First of all, capital lambda, wavelength of sound, right? I can use whatever wavelength of sound, it is very easy to produce all wavelengths of sound. Second thing is L. So, by the construction of a mode locker, these things have to be taken into construction, into consideration. It is not as if you can take a any piece of quartz and uh, apply some frequency, you will get mode locking. It is not the case. Okay. Now, what happens in mode lockers is that you work with not traveling waves, but standing waves. And at this point, let me ask, what is a standing wave? Yes. So, I got this animation. Unfortunately, in the web, the animation is endless. Here, it is not. Let us see it with trans. Yeah, see? So, basically, you have this red and blue. Did you see two waves, red and blue, propagating in opposite directions? Right? And one, when they superimpose, they give rise to a standing wave in which the position of the maxima and minima do not change. In fact, the position of the node also does not change. Okay? It just goes up and down. Maximum becomes minimum, minimum becomes maximum. Node remains the same. I will do it once again, see carefully. So, it is red and blue are traveling waves and the standing wave is in black, right? Yeah? The big wave? Blue? Cannot be blue. Blue, red and what is the other color, last color you saw? Green, okay, not black, green. So, look at the uh, green wave that is a standing wave, see how it changes with time. So, what I have here is that I have one, I have a red wave going from one direction to the other, I have an equivalent blue wave traveling in the opposite direction. See what happens to the green one. It is oscillating in, su in such a way that the nodes remain where they are. The maximum displacement, if you do not worry about sign, those positions are also the same. So, this is the kind of wave that you have. Okay. So, this is what you generate because what you do is you take a quartz crystal or something like that, you have a transducer at one end and polish the other end. So, the sound waves go back and forth and they set up a standing wave. Right? Now, the next question to ask is, very often, it is easy for us to understand transverse waves. Sometimes we get confused when we talk about longitudinal waves. What is a standing longitudinal wave? This is what the situation would be at different times. Let us say this here is your mode locker. You, are, you applied sound wave from this direction. So, at first instance, this is the rarefied portion. This is the dense portion, compressed portion, rarefied dense like that. After some time, it becomes homogeneous. After some other time, what happens is what was white now becomes black. What was black becomes white. That is the other extreme where maxima and minima change, uh, uh, maxima and minima interchange. right? Now, tell me, look at this line in time. Suppose a light goes to the middle, then what will the refractive index it experience be as a function of time? To start with, refractive index is high, very high, then it will go down, then it will be very high in the other direction, then it comes to a mean position and then it becomes very high again. So, this is how it will change. Right? Of course, refractive index will never become uh, negative. 
right? It will oscillate between a maximum and a minimum value periodically. And the point to understand here is that the period of oscillation is, it, it has some relation with period of oscillation with a sound wave also. What is the time period associated with a sound wave whose uh, angular frequency is omega? Angular frequency is omega. So, what is the time period? So, from this graph, can you tell me what the relationship is between angular frequency of uh, uh, refractive index and angular frequency of this uh, uh, sound wave or the time periods if that helps. Essentially same, right? So, it makes the refractive index change periodically. That is what it does. And this is the experimental setup in an ancient uh, spectrophysics laser. Actually, I have given only uh, this book reference, but this is discussed a little better in E. W. Small's uh, chapter 1, ch uh, chapter 2 in Topics in Fluorescent Spectroscopy, volume 1, right. So, this is an actual diagram of a spectrophysics laser from 3, 4 decades ago. The way they did mode locking is that right in front of the high reflector mirror, they put in this prism. Okay? So, this is a prism, light is incident from this direction. The triangular faces of the prism are polished and on one side, you apply a transducer. So, uh, I hope you can see in the diagram that the, these circles denote these regions of uh, differing uh, refractive index. That is the direction in which the sound wave is applied. Okay. So, what will happen? The omega beam will go in a particular direction. That direction is aligned with the axis of propagation of laser. This omega plus minus n delta go in other directions. So, these directions are not sustained. Propagation in these directions are not sustained in the lasing action. So, you only have uh, omega that can participate in lasing. Right? And since uh, the refractive index varies sinusoidally, well periodically, that is what causes mode locking. Wherever ref refractive index is the least, that is when light propagates most. And see, intense light is what will propagate uh, with the highest probability. And intense light comes from mode locking. Not only that, the uh, period of uh, oscillation of the refractive index in a mode locker is said to be exactly equal to the period of oscillation of a uh, pulse in the cavity. Okay? So, it acts as a gate. It lets the pulse through and then when the pulse does a round trip and comes back there, it finds a gate open anything that comes in between is not allowed to go through. That is how a, uh, uh, that is how mode locking is achieved. You cannot use this technique to make femtosecond pulses. Picosecond is where this works, uh, works most efficiently. Right? So, this is active mode locking and it is achieved by using what are called acoustoptic modulators AOMs in short and acoustoptic modulators are used in uh, other applications related to lasers as well. We will come to that. Now, let us talk about passive mode locking. What is the meaning of uh, passive mode locking? Uh, in passive mode locking, what you do is you uh, introduce an element in which you do not apply sound, do not apply voltage, do not apply anything. There is some property of the medium by which mode locking is achieved and the simplest uh, passive mode locking device is a dye cell, a very highly concentrated solution of some dye. Okay, the dye has to have some property, we will come to that. This is called the saturable absorber. Can someone tell me what the meaning of saturable absorber is? It has some maximum absorbance. No, see, anything will have a uh, spectrum anyway. Maximum threshold? Actually, that is right. So, that is called nonlinear absorption that it will absorb the light 
until the, what is the meaning of threshold? Threshold of what? Is the other way around. Low intensity light will be uh, will be blocked, and high intensity light will be allowed to pass through, and we'll see very schematically uh, what we mean by that. But before we go there, this would be the typical arrangement of uh, getting mode locking using a uh, passive mode locker. So, you keep a uh, solution of dye and when I say solution of dye, I mean very, very highly concentrated solution of dye. It should be so dark that if you hold it up in front of the light, you should not see any light. That is usually kept right in front of a mirror and we will see what you can use other than dyes also. But that is not the active medium, active medium is something else. Okay? So, right now what you see is a schematic, a very general schematic of a laser with a saturable absorber, passive mode locker. And this is a schematic of an actual laser once again from many years ago. You can see uh, the year of this paper, it was published in 1972. Applied physics letters 1972. So, here see carefully what the beam is. It is uh, a dye laser, right? And the dye that is used as an active medium is rhodamine 60. Where does it absorb? Where does it emit? Rhodamine 60? Yes. So, it absorbs green and it emits in red. Okay? So, this is the cavity. Here you have the high reflector, well you, you, here you have uh, one of these is the high reflector, here you have the two uh, concave mirrors and here this is where the argon ion laser is switched into the cavity by using a prism and then this here is the cavity. In the other end of the cavity you have DODCI, DODCI is a cyanine dye, you do not need to know the full name, it is a cyanine dye and which has uh, rather interesting photophysics, very short lifetime. So, and in fact, lifetime of the saturable absorber is also very important. It should be short if you want a short pulse. So, now what happens is this. You see, this is the emission spectrum you can say and emission spectrum of rhodamine and absorption spectrum of uh, uh, dot C. There is a strong overlap. So, dot C would uh, absorb the light that comes out from rhodamine, the emission of rhodamine. Okay. Now, see, let us consider two levels in DODCI, two levels involved in absorption process and let us say population of the lower one is N1, population of the higher level is N2. So, if you have a small intensity, then what will happen? that will be absorbed, right. When does absorption take place? When does transmission take place? Absorption will take place as long as N 1 is less than N 2. If you somehow achieve N 2 N 1 equal to N 2, then you get what is called bleaching. Okay? So, if there if you have a weak beam of light, it will just get absorbed and then the molecule comes down from its ground state to exci uh, sorry excited state to ground state and then it is reset once again. Once again, N 1 is very large number, N 2 is practically 0. However, what happens when there is a strong beam? If you have a strong beam, then it is possible to almost achieve population inversion, right? Almost but not quite, almost. And as you know and as you worked out yourself, pulse light is really very intense. So, let us say we have this laser cavity in which we have CW light propagating and pulse light propagating as well. CW light will be absorbed by the saturable absorber and therefore stopped, so its propagation will be hindered. Pulse light because it is intense will cause bleaching and will get transmitted. Okay? So, this uh, saturable absorber is going to select pulse light 
over CW light. Okay, so let me show you something. This is the actual data of pulse width. How we measure pulse width, we come to that sometime later. But this was a pulse width measured in 1972 using this absorber, using this apparatus, using this laser that you see. What is the pulse width written there? Yeah, 2.3 picosecond. So in this laser, you can get almost 2 picosecond was reported in 1972, right? So here, in this setup, what's happening is the argon ion acts only as a pump. If there is no saturable absorber, you are going to get a CW operation of the dye laser. Since the uh, saturable absorber has been in inserted, that is the only mode locking device there. There itself, you can get a pulse width that is as narrow as about 2 picosecond. So what happens is you can do better than this. You can do better if you have pulsing already and you use the saturable absorber only as a selector but not as the primary mode locking device. One thing that I want to say before uh, closing uh, this part of the discussion is, and I was actually hoping that you are going to say it. Will you agree with me if I say that the pulse gets narrowed as a result of this? See, let us consider that there is a pulse somehow. Mode locking has taken place. That always happens. Some amount of mode locking will take place. So that mode locked pulse is there. Now, if you have a saturable absorber while going through the uh, leading edge of the pulse, is going to be absorbed, isn't it? Do we agree? You have a pulse, something like this, in time, right? Initially, at the onset of the pulse, intensity is zero. Then it goes up gradually, well, quickly, to a maximum, and then it falls again. So, what will happen to the leading edge of the pulse? That will be absorbed. And that light will be used to produce, uh, to increase N2 more and more. Then there will, we will reach a time when bleaching will take place and from that instant onward, the pulse will go through. Do we agree? So this induction time for which the uh, population of the excited state is being prepared, that is the time when even the pulse will not be transmitted, it will be absorbed. So that portion of the pulse is cut off. So you end up, so let me give you some example. Let us say I have a 20 picosecond pulse, 20 picosecond full width half maximum. And let us say to keep the discussion simple, it takes 20 picosecond for bleaching to happen. What does that mean? What was full width that half maximum of the pulse now becomes the base of the pulse. So full width at half maximum par has becomes 2 picosecond, 3 picosecond, something like that. Okay? So it's important to understand that passive mode locking leads to uh, narrowing of pulses as well. Okay? So we'll stop here and we'll continue the discussion in the next module.